Among the early pioneers of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the 19th century was a woman named Jane Manning James. In this episode of Footnoting History, we're examining Jane's life, including her travels from Connecticut to Utah, and her experiences as a black woman in the nascent church. Hey everyone, Christine here. As regular listeners can probably tell from the opening, Elizabeth is with me. And we are excited to bring you the story of Jane Manning James, a woman whose life intrigued Liz, who then told me about her, and since I was intrigued too, we knew we had to share her story. But just before we start, we want to say thank you to all of our Patreon patrons out there, everyone from Christopher and Kara to Mandy and Cynthia. You all are what help keep us going. Yes, we are so thankful for your support. Now, what about Jane Manning James? What about her indeed? Our story begins, as stories do have all a beginning, in Connecticut around the year 1820. Now, there's some debate over the exact year that Jane was born, but it is largely agreed that she was born in May, so we'll say she was born in May, near the year 1820. This confusion over Jane's birth year has some repercussion, especially for the ages at which she places important events in her life versus the records that can be found but there'll be more on that later. What's important for Jane here is that in 1784, Connecticut had passed an act of gradual abolition. This meant that any child born enslaved would be freed by the time they were 25. This meant that although Jane's mother Phyllis was born enslaved, she was able to claim her freedom the year that she turned 25, which meant that her children, like Jane, were born free. There isn't much out there about Jane's father, though, other than that his name was Isaac Manning. And everyone, please prepare yourself, because there are a lot of Isaacs in this episode. So many Isaacs were in Jane's life. Jane was at least one of five children in the family, and yes, one of her brothers was also named Isaac. You'll notice this trend continues. Mm-hmm. When Jane was around six years old, she was sent to live with a family called the Fitches. They were still in Connecticut, but not, you know, exactly with her own family. And she worked for them as a domestic servant. The Fitches were Joseph and Hannah Fitch, and Jane later recalled that she was basically raised by their grown-up daughter. We don't know much about Jane's opinions of the Fitch family, but we do know that in 1841, Jane was baptized as a member of the New Canaan Congregational Church which was also the Fitch's church. While Jane may have been around the age of 20 when she converted and was baptized, she gives her age as around 14 for when she entered the church. So it's possible that Jane began attending church as a teen, but wasn't baptized until she was an adult. As it was one of the biggest branches of Christianity in Connecticut at the time, there are myriad reasons why Jane would have entered into this particular religion, though we can't confirm exactly which one drove her. It may well just have been that her proximity to it caused her to be baptized. What we can say for sure, though, is that her devotion to this church was not as strong as she would have liked. As an adult, she would recollect, quote, Yet I did not feel satisfied. It seemed to me there was something more that I was looking for, end quote. This feeling could certainly explain why, about a year later, she was intrigued by a missionary who came to Connecticut to introduce people to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The pastor at Jane's current church warned her against going to learn about this new faith, but she was determined to go, and when she did, her life was changed. So, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is often shortened to LDS or Mormon, is an American-originated branch of Christianity that started in upstate New York by a man named Joseph Smith. Smith's story is that he was guided by God to a place where an angel named Moroni entrusted him with golden plates that contained the word of God on them. The plates told the stories of people who lived in the Americas during the time of Christ, and Joseph was to be the new prophet who brought the word of God to the people. Joseph translated these stories into then-modern English, and in 1830 they were published as the Book of Mormon. One of the foundational beliefs of the church may have been attracted to Jane, a black woman in antebellum or pre-Civil War America. Mormonism was a millineristic religion. 
This means that the followers of the religion saw themselves as an oppressed group and believed that within a short time, the ruling class would be overthrown and their oppression would be ended. Compared to the Congregationalist church Jane was attending, she might have felt that she had more in common with this new faith of outsiders. In 1820, when Joseph Smith found his gold plate and Jane was allegedly born, the free non-white population of Connecticut was less than 3%. Like the early Mormons who stood out for their faith, in her home state, Jane stood out for her skin. But at the time when Jane was exposed to the theology, it's important to note that many of the doctrines and rituals considered essential to the core of the religion were still in their formation phase. And you'll see what we mean as we continue. Jane was so moved by this new religion that she was baptized a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints almost immediately. Her conviction must have been incredibly strong because she got most of her family to convert as well. Further, she felt confirmed in her belief that she found the correct church by the fact that when she prayed, she was granted the gift of tongues. The gift of tongues, as Jane's new church believed in it, mostly manifested in one of two ways. Sometimes you are suddenly able to speak a new language that you were never exposed to before, such as if you were only an English speaker and you were suddenly able to speak German or Swahili. But other times, you might speak in a way that no one could understand, which was often interpreted as that you were speaking the original language of Adam, the Bible's first man. Having one of these experiences, or both, was seen as confirmation of your faith, so Jane would have been thrilled that it happened to her. And now that Jane was a firmly believing member of the LDS Church, she decided it was time to follow one of the Church's major suggestions, that followers should try to gather together in Nauvoo, Illinois, where Joseph Smith currently had the Church's headquarters. Among those who went with Jane were her mother, her siblings, their spouses and children, and her own child. A few years prior, in 1835, Jane had given birth to a boy she named Sylvester, which means she would have been about a teen when she had him. The pregnancy and birth of Sylvester would coincide then with about the age that Jane said she joined the Congregationalist Church, which, by the way, I want you to know that I'm skipping the fascinating history of the <laughs> union of Congregationalist and Presbyterian churches that happened in the early 1800s, which explains why Jane referred to the Congregationalist Church she joined as Presbyterian. But again, skipping, sadly. Okay, we're going to let that slide right now because instead, I want to focus on Jane, her son, and her conversion. It has been asserted by some historians that Sylvester's father was a white preacher based on the word of Jane's brother, Isaac. Sylvester's granddaughter also said that she heard his father was a white French-Canadian. Jane herself never spoke, on record anyway, about the father. But again, Jane's son would have been born around the time she joined the Congregationalist Church, as she gives her age around 14, although she wasn't baptized until closer to 21. A dark and sad moment in Jane's tale could be, and this is pure conjecture as Jane, as I said, never spoke on it, is that her child's father was an adult white preacher who took advantage of a young girl who then felt guilty and hoped that baptism would eventually ease this guilt, but it didn't. For that reason, perhaps when the Mormons came to town, it was even easier for her entire family to join the new church that, as noted earlier, taught the oppressors would soon be overthrown. The family traveled west with the missionary who baptized Jane and a group of other converts. According to Jane, when the group reached Buffalo, New York, they were told that fares were to be collected for the journey through Ohio, and because her family did not have it, they had to split off from the group who were able to continue on by boat, while Jane and her family had to walk. And it was not a short walk. No. It was a long, exhausting walk that Jane remembered as one of the hardest things she'd ever done. They covered an estimated 800 miles through places that were not particularly friendly to black people. Although Jane and her family were free, this was a period before the Civil War, and a black family alone, walking for weeks, wasn't necessarily going to be well received in places where they weren't already known. For anyone familiar with Solomon Northup's 12 Years a Slave, he was kidnapped and enslaved in 1841, only a few years before Jane and her family set out to the West. It was, indeed, an incredibly dangerous time to be a free black American. As Jane would later describe it, quote, We walked until our shoes were worn out and our feet became sore and cracked open and bled until you could see the whole print of our feet with blood on the ground. We stopped and united in prayer to the Lord. We asked God, the Eternal Father, to heal our feet, and our prayers were answered and our feet were healed forthwith, end quote. Eventually, the family reached Peoria, Illinois. 
Illinois had a series of laws about immigration into the states for black people. Jane and her family ran into trouble because authorities demanded to see papers proving they were free as opposed to enslaved people who had run away. But the problem was that Jane and her family had always been free. They weren't in possession of papers of proof. It was touch and go for a while, and Jane tells us they were threatened with jail time, but somehow they managed to convince the Illinois authorities of their free status and were allowed to continue their journey. And thus, Jane and her family finally made it to Nauvoo. They did! And Nauvoo was the major gathering center for church members at the time. Historians estimate that in a three-year span around when Jane and her family arrived in 1843, the population of the town jumped from 4,000 to 12,000 inhabitants. Converts to the church poured in from various places in the United States and abroad. They all sought to be at the center of the religion's world and near to the prophet himself, Joseph Smith, who had ended up in Illinois after his religious movement was not loved in other areas of the country, to put it a little mildly. Jane's journey to Nauvoo brought her even closer to Joseph Smith than most. She and her family were directed to his house, which was at the time almost like an inn for travelers. She immediately met Smith, his wife Emma, and several others who were residing there. Eventually, Jane's family members found various places to live and work around Nauvoo, while Jane accepted the Smith's offer to let her live with them and work as a domestic servant. Given that it would allow Jane to live in super close proximity to the church's prophet, and that she had years of experience in domestic tasks, it's no surprise that she took them up on this job proposition. Although Jane lived with the Smiths for not less than a year, this period is one of her best documents, especially in terms of what she discussed later in life. It was here that she learned about Smith's polygamous marriages, that is to say, that he had wives other than just Emma. Which she said she accepted immediately. Yes, she also held close to her heart that she was able to touch the sacred robes that Smith wore. And even more than that, she spent time around the entire Smith family, including Joseph's mother, who allowed her to hold the Urim and Thummim. The Urim and Thummim to the LDS Church is a major deal. They were stones used to help translate or understand texts like the Book of Mormon in their original languages, or to receive revelations from God. Jane knew that these experiences she was having within the Smith residence were special, and that few other people could be as close to the prophet as she was. According to Jane, Mother Smith, as Joseph's mother was called, told her, quote, You are not permitted to see, meaning the Urim and Thummim, but you have been permitted to handle it. You will live long after I am dead and gone, and you can tell the Latter-day Saints that you were permitted to handle the Urim and Thummim, end quote. As a black woman who had been asked on her journey to Nauvoo to prove that she was free, this must have been another way that Jane felt that she was truly accepted by the LDS. Mother Smith wanted Jane to tell people that she had held these holy stones. There was one specific event that Jane told people about multiple times later in life. According to Jane, Joseph's wife, Emma, came to her and asked if she wanted to be adopted by the family. Unsure of what that meant, Jane turned down the offer. To an outsider in the modern day, this might seem rather strange, but not too important. Remember it, though, this is going to come back to just how important it was a little later on. As you can see already, Jane's time in Nauvoo was packed with significant events. Another one is that she received a blessing from Hiram Smith, the brother of Joseph Smith. In his blessing, Hiram Smith used conditional words and basically said that if you behave, then God will take care of you, including removing the, quote, mark upon your forehead, end quote. The mark in question was the mark of Cain. In the Bible, the story goes that there were two brothers, Cain and Abel, and once Cain killed Abel, God put a mark upon Cain. In this blessing, Hiram, like many others of this era, was saying that Jane's black skin was the mark of Cain and that black people as a whole were black because they were descended from Cain and only God could be the one to lift this extremely long-lasting mark. This perceived difference in biblical lineage between whites and blacks would be often used over the decades to justify different treatment of the races, meaning keeping black people out of things. 1844 was a major year for the church and it impacted Jane's life dramatically, because mere months after Jane received her blessing, Joseph and Hiram Smith were killed. They had been imprisoned following a series of events that began when people who disliked Smith and his church published a paper criticizing and attacking Smith 
both personally and the church as a whole. Smith supported retaliation in the form of destroying the presses used for printing it, as well as additional found copies. The situation escalated when a mob broke into the prison where the Smith brothers were held, and they were murdered. Jane, like many of the other faithfully devoted, was absolutely crushed. What would happen to her and the rest of the LDS members now that their leader was dead? Well, the answer to that was that they would move west. But before she went anywhere, Jane got married. Wait, let me guess. She married an Isaac? She did. Jane married Isaac James, a free black man who came to Nauvoo from New Jersey. So many Isaacs. I know. Lots of Isaacs. <sighs> and then, after a period of unease, Brigham Young became the leader of the church. The group left Nauvoo and traveled west until they settled in Utah, with the center of the church in what is now Salt Lake City. It's interesting to point out that when the LDS moved there in 1847, the region was not part of the United States. It was under Mexican control. However, it came under U.S. control fairly quickly in 1848 after the Mexican-American War ended, and it was an official territory by 1850. And by the time Jane reached Utah with her husband, she had two children instead of just Sylvester. Her second son, Silas, was born en route to their new home. Jane would ultimately have eight children. Sylvester plus seven with Isaac, only one of which was stillborn, and that one was yet another Isaac. As the family grew, it also settled in the Salt Lake region, where Isaac worked for Brigham Young as a coachman, and Jane also sometimes worked for him in a domestic capacity. The family established itself as pretty prosperous. They had land and some animals, but Jane's extended family, the people who went from Connecticut to Illinois, did not all follow her to Utah. So Jane's family then in Utah, meaning now her husband and children, they were some of the few black families in Utah, but Jane remained as devoted to her religion as she had ever been, even as the church changed. Because as I said earlier, being a new religion, it took time for the doctrines and practices of the church to solidify. What those solidified things would be were influenced by the people in charge, and the inclusion of the church's black members were part of this. We know that although the vast majority of church members were white, there was a black contingent, and during the time when Joseph Smith was alive, a few black men were granted the priesthood, meaning they were recognized as on the same footing as their white male counterparts spiritually. Smith had a checkered relationship with race, but he eventually spoke out against slavery, although he wanted to have the formerly enslaved people picked up and settled somewhere wherever they, other than wherever they currently resided. However, he had not firmed up any anti-black policy in the fabric of the religion, and in fact, when he ran for president in 1844, which would have been around the same time Jane lived with his family, he ran on an anti-slavery platform. Under Brigham Young, however, things became harder for Jane and the rest of the black saints. Young explicitly denied black men from receiving the priesthood, meaning that earlier equal footing between the men of the two races was now gone. Over time, church practices expanded restrictions so that black people were not allowed to receive all the required ordinances and endowments to achieve the same spiritual rewards in heaven, which was also called the celestial kingdom, as their white counterparts. In being denied these, it meant that black members of the church, like Jane, missed out on other things too. For example, Jane donated money to funds for the temple that were being constructed. But since they weren't granted full participation rights, Jane and her family were not allowed to go into the temple's most sacred spaces. In 1870, she had a personal change in her life. She divorced her husband Isaac, and he left the area. A few years later, Jane likely entered into another relationship, this time with a man named Frank Perkins. Frank Perkins was a black widower from Missouri whose daughter had married Jane's son Sylvester. But this too eventually ended. After that, her first husband returned, and when he passed away, she handled his funeral. The church, however, remained a constant in her life throughout all of this. Jane was active in the relief societies, where women joined together to help those in need within their community. She also never forgot her family and wanted the chance to be with them in the afterlife. As such, she made several trips, with you know, gaining permission, to baptize her dead. In Jane's religion, it was possible to baptize someone into the religion by proxy, but only after they had died. Jane could stand in for any of the women she wanted to baptize and join them to her eternal family posthumously. If she wanted male family members posthumously baptized, 
then a male would have to stand in for them. She did this multiple times for various deceased family members up until old age prevented her from going through the process anymore. In the 1880s, when Jane was in her 60s, she began to seriously think about what would happen to her when her life on earth ended. She knew how the church's treatment of black people stood, but she had lived up to the conditions in Hiram Smith's blessings, the one she'd received so long ago in Nauvoo. She had been faithful ever since the moment she heard the missionary back in Connecticut, and she was sure that she had worked hard enough to deserve receiving her endowments. So, she began to campaign for them. For a year, she reached out to church leaders, explaining her deep connections to the religion and asking for her ordinances and endowments so that she could be with her church family in the afterlife. Regularly, she returned to the story of the Smiths offering her adoption. By now, she saw it as a spiritual adoption that would allow her to be sealed, that is, joined, to the Smiths as a member of their family for eternity. Jane hoped that this was something she could have now, and when she was told no, she didn't stop trying for it. Aware that race was part of the issue, at one point, Jane even suggested sealing her to one of the two black men, now deceased, who had been granted the priesthood before the restrictions firmly set in. But this, too, was denied. In the mid-1890s, the leaders of the church decided that they needed to address this. So they chose to give her something. It wasn't what she wanted, and it wasn't a practice that they granted to other people regularly after her. So the best way to look at it is that they knew Jane desperately wanted to be sealed to the Smith family to secure her place in eternity, but they did not want to recognize her as a full-fledged member of the church because it was against their own policies. What they did was they told Jane that she could be sealed into Joseph Smith's family, but as a servant, an eternal servant. Needless to say, this was not something that Jane wanted, and she couldn't even attend the ceremony. It was done by proxy. No doubt the church's leaders hoped this would appease her. As you can imagine, it did not. Jane continued to fight for her proper endowments and full recognition from the church because she had given every ounce of herself to it and she was a true believer. She continued, too, to participate in events like Old Folks Day, and the image we used for this episode on our website shows Jane among the remaining pioneers in 1897 during the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the LDS's arrival in the Salt Lake region. There is even record that she and her brother had special seats just for them in the auditorium for major events. By the end of her life, she never strayed in her loyalty to her church, but she was not afraid to campaign on her own behalf. At the same time that Jane was fighting to be recognized as a full-fledged, entirely endowed member of the church, the church itself was approaching a special year, 1905, the 100th anniversary of the birth of Joseph Smith. Most of the people who knew Smith had either passed away or were old by then. It had been, after all, 60 years since he was killed. There was a movement to collect the memories of the early pioneers for posterity, and of course, Jane was among those whose recollections were sought. The most cited contemporary source we have on her life comes from this late 1890s, early 1900s era. It's an autobiography that Jane dictated to a woman named Elizabeth Roundy. Although historians have had to do work to fill in the gaps, having Jane's recollections has been incredibly helpful in gaining insight into her life and preserving her memory. What is tricky, though, is that Roundy's purpose for recording Jane's memories were to focus on Jane's memories of Smith as a prophet, which may be why some of the autobiography seemingly glosses over parts we are probably interested in. On the other hand, Jane also revered Smith as prophet, and perhaps hoped that this book would help her gain her rightful place in his family's celestial kingdom. And we've linked to her autobiography in the blog post for this entry. The dictated autobiography clearly meant a lot to Jane, because she requested that it be read aloud at her funeral. When she passed away on April 16, 1908, after a few years of declining health and losing her eyesight, her wish was fulfilled. At a service that included the president of the church in attendance, so one of the men who denied her request to receive her endowments, the piece was read. The autobiography shows Jane's struggles to get to Nauvoo, details her connection to Joseph Smith, and points out her lifelong dedication to the church. One passage that is particularly striking reads, quote, The Lord protects me and takes good care of me in my helpless condition, and I want to say right here that my faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ as taught by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is as strong today, nay, it is, if possible, stronger than it was the day I was first baptized. 
I pay my tithes and offerings and keep the word of wisdom. I go to bed early and rise early. I try in my feeble way to set a good example to all, end quote. Despite her lifetime of faith, Jane passed away without receiving the endowments and full inclusion she wanted. It took decades before there was a change for black members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In 1978, the Church reversed their exclusionary policies and granted its black members full participatory rights. Members of the Church had not forgotten Jane, and shortly after this change in policy, she was finally granted her full endowments, done by proxy, over 70 years after her death, which for Jane, who believed strongly that baptism performed after someone's death could bring them into the LDS Church, we like to think that this would have given her comfort, although most likely she would have preferred to have received them while on this mortal plane. Interested in owning some footnoting history merch? You can find out more through our shop link at www.footnotinghistory.com. Want to support the show and keep it open access? Our Patreon is at patreon.com forward slash footnoting underscore history. You can also follow us on Twitter at History Footnote or on Facebook and Instagram as Footnoting History. And of course, the best stories, like Jane's, are always in the footnotes.